Uh, how have you found your whole experience of doing it? Um, really good, but also really exhausting. I made, the I don't know yet if it's a stupid um, decision, but I decided I wanted to do it by train rather than car. And about after five shows, carrying a guitar and a heavy bag, and almost always seeming to be with commuters, was like, this just isn't rock and roll. This is, I just feel like a commuter every day. But now we're driving, so I'm driving around Scotland, and it's just as stressful, so I don't know which one. That's the boring answer. It's been good. <laughs> You mentioned Scotland there, you played in last night, and then you've got Aberdeen and Glasgow. Yeah. Um, how do you find performing in front of Scottish audiences? Uh, tonight was brilliant, like really, really warm. They were up for it. I hate audiences that are too polite and too quiet and won't respond if I ask them something. They were really open to They wanted to talk back for sure. And I, it was a good mix of that. It felt very different to um, Manchester. Felt different to Manchester which they were a bit like, come on then, make us laugh, you southerner. Um, but then they were brilliant. It was like, yeah, I slightly had to prove myself. And then once I did, they were really lovely. But no, what I was going to say is, it was different to when, I, I've, when I've played Edinburgh during the festival. Because they can be a bit hard work, audiences, you know? They've, they could see 3,000 other shows, literally, and they, they sit there going, well, the in the same day. <laughs> and they... They're just sitting there going, well then, you know, we could have seen anyone else and we decided to come and see you, this better be good. Or they've seen 3,000 shows already that day and they're just fatigued. But it's a really, it's, it's hard during the festival. You get a, such a weird mix that you wouldn't normally get anywhere else. So then coming to Edinburgh outside of the festival is like, oh wow, a normal audience that are just really happy to come out and see a show and not been like killed by an overload of senses you know so good so far and Glasgow I really love they're they're similar they're quite vocal and quite um, you know they're not afraid to give you a bit of shit and but in a good way good shit <laughs> Is there something quite different about Scottish audiences in other places in the country? Or? I feel like Scottish audiences are... Um, they're a bit piss-takey. Like, they're not... They're not like, you're the funny guy and we've come to see you so, and we'll just be quiet. It's like, if they've got something funny to say, they'll say it. The only other place I've been to that reminds me a bit of Scottish shows is Liverpool. Um, in just that... They're, they, they can sometimes be as funny as you are, like with the Scottish audiences, which is both lovely, but really fucking annoying, because you're like, no, 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 I'm the comedian. But um, like tonight, everyone, there were quite a few people that um, kind of uh, chipped in, but I like it. I probably get some of my best stuff from ad-libbing with, people. yeah, <laughs> from other people. <laughs> By the way, this is just uh, my um, split personality talking <laughs> off on there. Um, yeah, no, do, I always because when you do your material over and over again, you get sort of a bit. You can get a bit bored of it. So when people give you some new things to play with, and it's really fun, especially if they're if they're nice. You know, they can be a bit cheeky, but. Yeah, it's and good. It's a bit strange, well, you know, from going and doing TV for a number of years, and when you tell a joke, you're not having someone kind of contribute to that. Um, is it a bit of a not on my watch. <laughs> How do you find kind of doing stand up in contrast to? Being oh, it's so much, so much more fun. Like the touring and the travelling and the bad food of to uh, of being on the road is not great but the actual comedy bit is so much more fun because you're getting all this feedback it's also more terrifying as well but you get this instant response but when you do comedy and my subconscious over there will agree with me when you do comedy when you film it you've written it you wrote it a few weeks ago a few months ago and you think it's hilarious and then you rehearse it and then you get to the day you film it and because you know it so well and everyone else has heard it a million times, you do a take and then no one laughs. And you're like, oh, 
maybe it's not funny anymore. Or, but it isn't that, it's just everyone knows it. You can't be funny for the fifth time, it just can't. And sometimes that freaks you out, you think, Oh shit! Maybe it isn't. Maybe it isn't any good. Maybe and you try and change it, or you ad lib, and then everyone's laughing behind the camera. You see that, but that's just because it's new. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's you have to try and remember why it was funny all those years, all those weeks ago. Whereas when you do stand up, you instantly know whether it's funny or not. And if it is, if the audience laugh, it's the best feeling. And if they don't, you literally want to kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a, in contrast, obviously, to uh, not laughing when you're filming, is there sometimes that you just you try your hard not to laugh and it just happens like, when you're trying to film something? What it's you mean? It's been a while since you filmed anything, hasn't it? <laughs> Thanks. Um, what, what do you mean? Like, what? You d deliberately try to make people corpse? Is that what you mean? Or? Um, had a line that you've been meaning to say and then you've just burst it laughing. Oh, yeah, yeah, loads. I mean, the worst is always, for some strange reason, it's always when you're trying to be serious that I think if there's a moment where it's like actually a bit dramatic and and then everyone, someone starts getting the giggles. It's like being at, you know, when you're at school and you're in the assembly and you don't really get this in adult life anymore because... Not, there aren't scenarios where you're not allowed to laugh other than maybe a funeral, I guess. But there was when you and a friend started to get the giggles in assembly or in class, and it's because you're not allowed to laugh, it, was, it made you laugh even more. And there's something so amazing about that, not being al allowed to laugh. And you get that on set if you're doing a serious scene. You know, like you're, you start getting a bit more. But when you're making each other laugh, Deliberately, yeah, you can, you can have that. I think, but I think you get used to each other, the other actors and performers dicking around, and it's, it is weird how ordinary it becomes after a while. Do you know what I mean? Like you just get used to funny people being funny. And uh, yeah, talking about your your tour again, obviously during the show you talk about uh, your life and some of your experiences. Um, was there anything you can? Uh, remembered about things that you've done like while we've been on tour and you've been doing the show this tour any particular things same thing while we've been talking about your life has anything kind of just come up that you've remembered from, from doing it uh uh, weirdly, I don't understand the question. Has <laughs> it been a kind of chance for you to reflect on uh, your life by doing Oh, um... You, you always reflect on your life. Yeah, I do, actually. Daily. I reflect. I, the first thing I do when I wake up and I'm conscious is reflect. Um, I'm like, mm, how was that sleep? That was, uh... No, I... I don't know, I guess weird thing is, is you do go, like, because this tour is um, four years after my TV show was on, and I haven't toured for two or three years, sort of three years, I think, and the weird thing is, is you come out and all these people are still coming to see me, and they're really big fans of the show, and, and it does make you kind of grateful that people like something you did so much that it doesn't matter that it's still on, that they still like coming to see whatever you do and that's really like, that's been good. And um, you know, you've, you've also kind of like stated before that um, you can have a more um, maybe familiar audience or similar audiences that you're going to show because they've watched the, yeah. um, the show on TV. Um, how much did that kind of change within your show or did you adapt to no. Now that I remember the first tour I ever went on after the TV show had been on, and I was genuinely like, "What is my audience? What are they going to be like? Who?" And I'd done a few gigs and things in London where people would come, and I noticed like there was definitely a demographic of young guys in their early twenties <laughs> who will dress at Top yes. Man. And they're all kind of like wannabe Don Danbury type. And I remember thinking, oh, is that, is that it? Is it like just those sort of people? Have I just attracted like, like mini lads or something? And, you know, which is great. I, I'm like, I just, I'm happy whoever watches it. But there was also a part of me that was like, 
they do know that, that like Don's ironic. They don't. They do know he's not like someone to look up to. I hope. But anyway, then I went on tour and realised that the them, you know, the people that come see me is a really bizarre, wide mix of age, race, uh, class, or whatever. And it was really nice to know that it kind of reaches a different. But I didn't ever really adapt. If anything, like tonight's show, I do that bit about, um, you know, stumbling across gay porn. And tonight was the first time where it got a bit weird. Like I could feel the room, like not sure if they were going with me on this and I've always been surprised that people every night up until tonight have just been they love that routine and I've always thought it's quite a edgy routine and yet so I'm, I'm I like that people are willing to go with me wherever you know I think you should dictate what you're doing and they should come to you but you do sometimes worry about are your audience going to like what you're doing and stuff? There must be quite interesting as well if you get different reactions and different shows around the country. Yeah. Yeah, and also um, it's quite interesting watching how different people are in that part of the country compared to that. Like, when you do stuff in the very south, like Kent or Sussex, they're very reserved and very quiet and polite. And when you do stuff in the north, they're much more like... Um, Angry? No, they're not angry. They're more like, they're just more direct. And then Scotland, I guess, coming back to your earlier thing, is they're more vocal. Um, but you you do def definitely get differences in different parts of the country. And then you sort of start, in really broad terms, start realising where stereotypes come from, because you sort of go, oh, you are a bit like, as a collective, not as individuals, you are a bit like a typical you know, Birmingham group or a Manchester, you know, you sort of realise that there's ever, you know, I, I sort of hate saying this, but there is a weird truth in some of the cliches and um, comedy is a good way of sort of spotting that. And uh, you were talking about, um, obviously, Don Danbury as well. Um, did you kind of, and you are talking about the, the guys that you thought were kind of attracted to Don as a person, mm. that's why they come to the show. Um, was it more a case of you seeing people like that before you came up with Don and you kind of wrote part of them and performed on the show? What was your kind of inspiration for a that? It was simply, like, it was organic because we did these shorts uh, for the Paramount Comedy Channel, which is now Comedy Central. And they were literally just things you shouldn't say on a date or things you shouldn't say at work or whatever. And it was just this, these little sketches, but we, after we made them, me and the producer just kept going, wouldn't it be funny if there was a guy that just always, like, he thinks he's really cool and such a, like, ladies' man and he thinks he's funny and charming and, um, and like, just has a really high opinion of himself, but he actually just always does and says the wrong thing. He's just, like, he just has no self-awareness. And it just sort of expanded from that. And the whole kind of look and swagger was just... I guess it is indicative of those sorts of guys who do think they're quite cool and stuff, but it really wasn't like, oh, I've seen people like that, therefore I'm going to write about them. And then when people, a lot of people said to me, oh, you really remind me of my brother, or you remind me of my friend, or, or my boyfriend, or whatever, that happened a lot. And I was like, really? So clearly there is a, a, a lot of Don Danbury's out there, and I had no idea I'd written something that existed. <laughs> and uh, just to kind of finish off as well, um, what are your kind of plans for the next kind of year or so? Um, going to meditate for a year. Um, no, I've got some, I've got uh, stuff, I'm working on some TV stuff and uh, a film I'm due to direct. Uh, we'll see if that happens because film is quite a precarious thing, it seems to quite, but it's been in development for a year or so. Um, and then um, maybe, dare I say it, maybe do some live stuff again at some point. But hopefully doing, uh, I've got a few TV things that I want to um, try and get back on TV. People keep saying to me, why aren't you doing a new TV show? And it's like, well, first of all, you've got to come up with the idea. Then you've got to convince channels to pay lots of money to, get, to let you do it. 
and uh, it sort of takes longer than I think people realise. But I've, I've, I'm very close to something which I'm don't want to jinx, but touch wood, it's gonna it's gonna happen soon. That's great. Thank you so much.